I have been with my fiance Tina for nine years now. We are both 34 years old. She has two sons with her ex from high school. One is 14 years old and the other is 12 years old. Both good kids. I've always been there for them with zero issues. Tina has always provided for the kids financially and hardly asked me for anything. We always covered the bills 50-50 and I always covered her kids financially when she couldn't, which wasn't often, with no problem. Likewise, if I was ever short on money, she would send me far more than I actually needed and refuse to let me pay her back. Money was never an issue. The issue is time. Well, she just gave birth to my baby eight months ago. A perfect baby girl who is the absolute apple of my eye. I didn't know I could love this much. The problem is that it's grown increasingly obvious that I just want to spend time with my daughter. I'm barely home as it is. I work six days a week. Tina works from home. When I'm home, I literally just want to hang out with my daughter because I'm barely able to. I go to work at 5 a.m. and I don't get home until 4.30 to 5 p.m. I only get around four hours to hang out a day. I want to scoop my daughter up and just hang out with her. That's it. That's all I want. I'm already missing so much. But Tina's two sons every single day are asking me as soon as I get home to hang out with them, to play pass with them, to go to the park with them, to go swimming or fishing or whatever else. And I keep getting irritated because dividing my time and not spending that time with my daughter is physically paining me. Well, Tina asked me last night what was going on because she said that she can no longer ignore the fact that I'm acting like I hate her sons. I told her that I don't hate them at all. I actually love them a great deal. But I can't ignore the fact that I truly have zero desire to divide my time between them and our daughter, considering our daughter is growing like a Zaza and I'm already missing everything. She looked extremely hurt and said that her sons keep asking why I don't like them anymore. And she asked that I talk to them. I told her that I would eventually talk to them, but right now it would be nice if she could just explain to them that I'm trying to be a dad. She said, yeah, well, you seem to be forgetting that you played dad for nine years before you had a baby, and now you're pushing them away like last week's garbage. She was getting snippy with me and visibly irritated at this point, so I just snapped and said, I don't want to freaking take care of your kids right now. She starts crying and walks away. I tried apologizing later and she wouldn't speak to me. I tried hugging her and she asked me not to touch her. She slept in the nursery. I went to work this morning. I just got home and they are gone. Most of their stuff is gone. There's a note on the table that says, I will not jeopardize my older kids' mental health for the sake of your feelings. I will bring our daughter by to see you once a day and give you time with her and then leave again. We can work out a custody agreement later on when she's no longer breastfed. I wish you the best. I'm gutted. I called my buddy just to vent and cry or whatever. And he said, well, isn't this what you wanted? Now you get time with your kid without distractions from kids that aren't yours. I don't know how to feel. I didn't mean I wanted them to leave, and I definitely didn't imply that I didn't love them anymore. She won't speak to me. She said, I will not be answering texts unless they are about our daughter, and has not returned my numerous phone calls to fix this. Am I the idiot? Now, for a few comments before the update. Comment 1. You're the idiot. Everyone is talking about you being their father figure for nine years, but let's put it in plainer terms. Since they were three and five years old. You said, every single day they are asking me as soon as I get home to hang out with them, to go play pass with them, to go to the park with them, to go swimming or fishing or whatever else. These boys are 12 and 14. Your words imply that these are actions that you previously did. Now, they are her kids and can frick off. Buddy, haven't you ever heard, be careful what you wish for, you might get it? Pfft. Enjoy your time with your daughter. Comment 2. You're the idiot. Finally, a parent in this sub who will put their children over their terrible, selfish partner. You are getting exactly what you deserve. Now, the absolute best case scenario is that when your daughter gets a little older, you'll still have to work, so you'll get those evening hours with just her 50% of the time. The other time, you don't get to see her at all. And that's if you get 50 50ths, which based on your behavior, you won't. Now, for the update. Hey everyone, thanks for reading my last post and for all the support and advice. It's been a tough week since Tina left with the kids. I've been trying to process everything that's happened and figure out how to move forward. The first few days after they left were a blur. I couldn't eat, couldn't sleep, and couldn't focus on anything. 
I kept replaying our argument in my head, wishing I had handled things differently. I tried calling Tina countless times, but she wouldn't answer. I even drove by her parents' house, where I figured she was staying, but I couldn't bring myself to go to the door. As promised, Tina has been bringing our daughter by once a day for a few hours so I can spend time with her. It's been bittersweet. I cherish every moment with my baby girl, but it's hard seeing Tina and not being able to talk to her or hold her. She's always quick to leave and I can tell she's still hurting from what I said. I've been doing a lot of reflecting on my relationship with Tina's sons. I realize now that I've been pulling away from them ever since our daughter was born, and that wasn't fair to them. They didn't do anything wrong and they deserve to have a father figure in their lives who loves and supports them. I've been so focused on my own feelings that I didn't stop to consider how my actions were affecting them. I decided to write each of the boys a letter, apologizing for my behavior and telling them how much I love them. I poured my heart out, sharing memories of all the good times we've had together over the years and promising to be a better stepdad moving forward. I gave the letters to Tina when she dropped off our daughter and I could tell she was touched by the gesture. Later that night, Tina called me for the first time since she left. She said she had read the letters to the boys and that they were both in tears. She said they miss me and wanna come home, but she's still not sure if that's the right thing to do. She's worried that I'll just push them away again and that it will be even harder on them the second time around. I told Tina that I'm committed to being a better partner and father and that I'm willing to do whatever it takes to earn back her trust and the boys' trust. I suggested that we start with family therapy to work through our issues and learn how to communicate better. Tina agreed to think about it, but said she needs more time before she can make a decision. In the meantime, I've been trying to stay busy and focus on being the best dad I can be to my daughter. I've been reading parenting books and taking online classes to learn more about child development and how to be a supportive partner. I know I have a lot of work to do, but I'm determined to be the man my family deserves. Looking back, I realize that my own childhood experiences have played a big role in how I've handled things with Tina's sons. My dad was always working and never had time for me, and I guess I was subconsciously trying to make up for that with my own daughter, but I know now that I can be a good father to all of my kids, biological or not. It's not about dividing my time equally, but about making sure each child feels loved and supported in their own way. I don't know what the future holds for me and Tina, but I do know that I'm going to keep fighting for my family. I'm hopeful that with time and effort, we can heal the wounds I've caused and come out stronger on the other side. I'll never forget the look on Tina's face when I said those hurtful words, and I'll do everything in my power to make sure she never feels that way again. Thanks again for all the support and advice. It means more than you know. Am I the idiot for changing the locks on my late mother's house to keep my estranged siblings out? My mother went to the hospital for tests and something went wrong, leading to her unexpected passing. The doctor called me as I was her medical contact. I am the eldest of six children from the same parents and was the only one who had an ongoing relationship with her. We all experienced various forms of childhood emotional trauma. I set up safe boundaries early on and she was a better grandmother than a mother. We always did something for birthdays, Mother's Day, and Christmas, and I would call and catch up with her every two weeks or so. Most of my siblings had not spoken to her for years. My brother used to contact her every six months or so, but they had recently fallen out and I am not sure of the reason. The hospital gave me her belongings, handbag, etc. My siblings wanted to meet up at her home the next day. I thought it was a bit soon, but they wanted to start sorting out her estate. I unlocked the door using the key in mom's handbag. The first argument was about who would have possession of the key to mom's house. I said I would keep it until we either found mom's will and would then hand it to the executor, or if there was no will, I would hand the key to the chosen administrator. My brother did not like this and asked why I did not give it to someone else. As I already had another key at home, I did not have any other key. My other siblings jumped on the bandwagon and I was yelled at, harassed, and bullied for the next hour, with all of them accusing me of lying. Everyone then started sorting through items. I grabbed the bills so I could pay them and prevent the power, phone, etc. from getting turned off. The only thing decided on that day was that two people must be at mom's house. No one person would be able to go on their own. On the next visit to the house, my husband and I purchased two new front door locks. We installed both locks on the front door 
so two new keys would be needed to enter the home. We made sure to open the lock package in front of my sister, who lived closest to mom's house so she could remove all the keys. My sister had one key and I had the other, and both keys were needed to gain entry to the house. I was under the impression that this would solve the issue with entry to the house and ease everyone's concerns, as they were brand new locks with brand new keys, and it would resolve the argument about who else had copies of keys. However, I was accused of taking keys to both locks. Even when I explained how we opened the lock packs and my sister removed all three keys for one of the locks herself, she refused to confirm this and did not support me. This only led to more scapegoating and bullying. If I had not changed the locks, I would have been accused of still having a key to the house. They still will not let this go, and it has been four years since she passed. Is there any way we will all be able to move past this? Could there have been a better way for me to handle this situation? Now for a few comments before the update. Comment one, don't even worry yourself about people coming out of the woodwork to cash in. They're selfish individuals. Carry on doing what you think is best because they only care about themselves. If they can't accept you did something to settle their unfounded issues, anything you do will be wrong. Comment two, not the idiot, and I'm sorry for your loss, and I'm sorry your siblings are selfish individuals. Have you hired an administrator for the estate? Or did your mom have a will naming an executor? Have you spoken with an estate attorney? Now, for the update. Hey there, thanks for the update. It's been a tough few days since I last wrote, and a lot has happened. After the initial meeting at mom's house, tensions were still running high among my siblings. We decided to meet again the following day to continue sorting through mom's belongings and try to find her will. When we arrived at the house, I noticed that someone had gone through the bills I had set aside to pay. They were scattered all over the kitchen table, and some were even missing. I asked my siblings about it, but no one would admit to touching them. It was frustrating, but I gathered what I could find and made a mental note to keep a closer eye on important documents. As we were going through mom's things, I stumbled upon an old photo album tucked away in the back of her closet. Inside were pictures of us as kids, happy memories from family vacations and birthdays. It was a bittersweet moment, remembering the good times we had with mom, despite the challenges we faced. I showed the album to my siblings, hoping it might bring us together, but they barely glanced at it before going back to arguing over who should get what. Later that day, I overheard my brother on the phone with a lawyer, discussing mom's estate. I was surprised, as we hadn't even found her will yet, when I confronted him about it, he got defensive and accused me of trying to control everything. The argument escalated, and soon all of my siblings were involved, taking sides and rehashing old grievances. In the midst of the chaos, I remembered something mom had told me years ago. She had confided in me that she had hidden some important documents in a safe deposit box at the bank, just in case anything happened to her. I had completely forgotten about it until that moment. I decided to go to the bank the next day to see if I could access the safe deposit box. To my surprise, mom had listed me as a co-owner on the account. Inside the box, I found her will, along with some other important papers and a letter addressed to all of us. In the letter, mom expressed her love for each of us and her hope that we would come together as a family after she was gone. She also revealed that she had left her house to be divided equally among us with the stipulation that we had to agree on what to do with it. If we couldn't come to a consensus, the house was to be sold and the proceeds split evenly. I brought the will and the letter back to mom's house to share with my siblings. At first, they were skeptical and accused me of hiding the documents from them. But as I read mom's words aloud, the room fell silent. For the first time in days, we were all on the same page, united in our grief and our love for our mother. We spent the rest of the day talking, really talking, about our memories of mom and what she meant to each of us. We also discussed what to do with the house and after some debate, we agreed to keep it in the family as a gathering place for holidays and special occasions. It wasn't easy and there were still some hurt feelings and unresolved issues among us. But mom's letter had reminded us of what was truly important, our bond as a family. We knew it would take time and effort to rebuild our relationships, but we were willing to try for mom's sake and for our own. As I reflect on the past few days, 
I realized that there may have been better ways to handle the situation with the locks and the keys. Perhaps I could have been more transparent about my intentions and communicated more clearly with my siblings. But in the end, it was mom's love and wisdom that brought us together, not the logistics of settling her estate. Moving forward, I know there will be more challenges and disagreements as we navigate life without mom, but I also know that we have the strength and the love to overcome them, as long as we remember what truly matters. Thanks for listening, and I'll keep you updated as we continue on this journey together. Am I the idiot for losing my cool at a restaurant over not getting forks and being told off by my kids? Update. Thank you for confirming that despite this being a stupid plastic fork, it was very poor service for no one in the restaurant to give us any for our meals. But I would also like to note that my children are not TAHs either. I was a bit confounded and a little hurt that they did not share my frustration with the service at the place, but they are very good people and great representatives of their generation. They do respect me and will defend me. They just thought that I could have handled this whole thing more quickly and less sharply. We've discussed this since I posted it, and they now understand that maybe they should have jumped in to get the forks using their own methods of handling things, rather than pointing out that I was being loud and attacking the guy who had delivered our food. I don't recall my tone the same way they do, but most of us are not fully aware of how we impact others, so I accept that their version of events is accurate. So please do not call my kids AHs or stupid or doormats. They've actually advocated pretty well for themselves in life, but they expect far less from people in the service industry than I do, and so their initial reaction was to try to calm me down. Peace. My Generation Z children, adults, are pretty well convinced I am the AH and they did their best to protect the staff from me. Although their lack of acknowledging how the service was unacceptable only made me angrier. Here's what happened. We went out to eat at an S Mexican chain restaurant. It has hybrid service. You order at a counter, then they deliver food to you. But they expect the usual 15 to 25% tips. There's also a self-service for condiments, plastic utensils, and soft drinks. I ordered a margarita and $1.11 salad and chips to share. My family placed their orders and we found a table. My salad arrived first, but no chips and no fork. I asked the food server for a fork and she pointed to a table behind her and said to get it there. That's how I learned of the self-service part. But when I went up to the table, there were no forks. I only saw knives. I told the family I was going to get forks and one of my kids said to wait, they'd take care of it. My kid, presumably asking in the most polite way possible at the order counter, struck out. The staff still didn't bring the forks and now everyone else's food has arrived. But no forks, no margaritas, no cups for water and no forks. I asked the guy delivering food if he could please get us forks, and he said he would, but he didn't. In all, 15, 20 minutes passed from when I first asked for a fork. The rest of the family had rice, beans, chicken, etc., and they found spoons. So they ate their meals with spoons. But here I am, looking at these big leaves of lettuce and thinking that without a fork, I'd have to dig into the salad with my hands. So, despite my kids telling me that I have no patience and was making too big of a deal of this, I went up to the counter where we ordered and I told the woman that I'd been waiting 15, 20 minutes for a fork to eat my salad. She said, I had a lot of other things I needed to take care of. Note, the restaurant had a few other tables, but there was no line of people waiting to order. I told her that I also didn't receive my drink or water or chips, and I wanted the drink and chips refunded. She started doing the refunds when my spouse walked up and grabbed four plastic forks and a cup from the counter on their side of the plexiglass. I tried to also reach across the plexiglass, but wasn't tall enough. The fork I had waited for, and which was never going to arrive, was literally two steps away from the woman who delivered my salad. This was a stupid thing to show my A over, but no matter how I think of it, I don't understand how lacking an eating utensil isn't a big deal. It's not like the staff had no control over this problem. They had total control, and the solution was two steps away. I just don't get why they never gave us the forks and why my kids think I overreacted. Anyone who understands, please explain. Now, for a few comments before the update. Comment one, you didn't show your buttocks, the staff there were just being lazy, and the woman who had the nerve to say to you, I had a lot of other things I needed to take care of, should be reported to the district manager because that was incredibly rude. 
I hope you didn't tip at all because they didn't earn it, not the idiot. Comment two, not the idiot. Quarter of an hour wait for a plastic fork? Oh, hell no. That's a one-star review territory. Several people went to ask for utensils too, so they knew very well there weren't any available for other customers either. What was the staff's plan here? Your kids need a reality check. Now, for the update. Thank you for the update and for providing more context about your children's perspective on the situation. It's great to hear that you've had a chance to discuss the incident with them and gain a better understanding of their point of view. It's been a week since the fork fiasco at the Mexican restaurant, and I've had some time to reflect on what happened. I appreciate the comments and insights shared by readers, as they've helped me see things from different angles. A few days after the incident, my spouse and I decided to have a heart-to-heart -heart with our children about the whole situation. We wanted to understand their perspective better and explain our own feelings without the heat of the moment clouding our judgment. As we sat down together, I could sense that my kids were a bit apprehensive about the conversation, but they were also willing to listen and share their thoughts. My daughter, the eldest, started by explaining that while she understood my frustration with the lack of forks and poor service, she felt that my reaction might have been a bit excessive. She pointed out that the restaurant staff seemed overwhelmed and understaffed, and that perhaps a gentler approach could have yielded better results. My son chimed in, saying that he had tried to get the forks discreetly to avoid causing a scene, but admitted that he could have been more assertive in his request. As I listened to their perspectives, I couldn't help but feel a mix of emotions. On one hand, I was proud of my children for their empathy and desire to handle the situation calmly. They had grown into compassionate adults who valued kindness and understanding, even in the face of frustrating circumstances. On the other hand, I realized that my own reaction had been fueled by a deeper sense of feeling disrespected and unheard. Growing up, I had always been taught to stand up for myself and not let others take advantage of me. My parents had instilled in me a strong sense of self-worth and the belief that I deserved to be treated with respect, especially when paying for a service. As I shared this with my children, I could see a flicker of understanding in their eyes. We talked about the balance between advocating for oneself and showing compassion for others, even when they may not be meeting our expectations. My spouse shared a story from their own childhood where they had witnessed their father calmly but firmly addressing a similar situation in a restaurant. It was a light bulb moment for all of us, realizing that there were different ways to handle these situations effectively. As the conversation continued, we also delved into the changing dynamics of the service industry and the challenges faced by workers, especially in the wake of the pandemic. My children shared stories of friends who worked in restaurants and the stress they often endured due to understaffing and demanding customers. It was eye-opening for me to consider these perspectives and realize that my own expectations might need to adapt to the current realities. By the end of our discussion, I felt a renewed sense of connection with my children and a deeper appreciation for their viewpoints. We agreed that in the future, we would try to approach similar situations with a balance of assertiveness and empathy and that we would communicate more openly about our expectations and concerns. Looking back on the fork incident, I can see how it served as a catalyst for growth and understanding within our family. It reminded me that even in the face of frustrating circumstances, there is always an opportunity to learn, connect, and find common ground. And while I may not have handled the situation perfectly, I am grateful for the lessons it taught us and the stronger bonds it fostered between my children and me. Thank you for reading and for your continued support. Your comments and insights have been invaluable in helping me navigate this experience and gain new perspectives. If you liked this video, you'll probably like these too. Also, while you're here, please consider subscribing. It's your support that keeps this channel alive and allows me to make better and longer videos. Have a great day.